Amen. All right, so we're in Luke chapter 15. Uh, this is the story of the prodigal son. And uh, yeah, man, the Lord put it on my heart uh, to preach this while I was on vacation. Praise God. We're going to start off in verse. I'm going to go ahead and read the passages to you. We're going to start off in verse uh, verses 1 and 2, but then we're going to skip down to 11, and I'm going to read the story of the prodigal to you, okay? So, because I want to give you a little bit of some surrounding context of what's going on in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15. It says, and I'm reading out of the King James Version. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now, real quick, publicans is another word for tax collector. And in this time frame, the tax collectors were looked down. They were put in the same place as basically prostitutes. Uh, that's how they were seen by the Jews of the day because they were extorting their own people. Okay, so I want you to understand, like, publicans and sinners, the tax collectors to these religious people was the worst of the worst. Okay. So it then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him and the Pharisees and the scribes. See, these are the religious people. I know you've seen religious folk before. And, and Lord help us, but help us not to have a spirit of religion. But, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And then he began to speak a parable. Now let's get down to verse 11 and we'll read the story of the prodigal. It says, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. In other words, give me my inheritance. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring here the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat. And be married. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry. And would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve you. Neither transgressed I at any time your commandment. And yet you never gave me a kid, which is a baby goat, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, your son was come, which had devoured your living with harlots, you have killed him. You have killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is yours. It was meet for me, or it was the right thing for me, that we should make merry and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we pray that your presence would be in the word just as you were in the worship. 
Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord God, that this morning as you speak to us, that we would all be able to see ourselves at least at one point in time in our lives as a prodigal, that we would all be able to see hope like in the midst of this story. Lord, I pray that you would speak, Lord God, and that you transform us on the inside because your word is truth, oh Lord God, and your word transforms us, Lord, it sanctifies us and changes us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And there's a recurring theme within the scriptures about banquets and about rejoicing in the midst of banquets. Uh, as a matter of fact, in chapter 14, the one that leads up to this is the story of the wedding banquet, Luke's version, uh, which compares to Matthew chapter 22, the wedding banquet, right? Whenever the king is sends out an invitation and he, and he explains to everyone, won't you come and won't you be part of the wedding banquet of my son? And see, the parables of the kingdom of God, they show us glimpses of God's heart related to the truth of his word. And so in the wedding banquet, what we're seeing thing there is God's heart and the fact that God is releasing the invitation for people to come and to be part of the marriage of his king's son. You see, the scripture teaches us that Jesus is the bridegroom and that the church is his bride. Amen. And so the, 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 the invitation has been going out through the ages of human history and the invitation has been inviting people to come and, and to marry themselves and to be part of the celebration uh, regarding his son. But whenever you read it, it, you see that people are busy. And basically that's what's happening. It's like, well, I got some property, man. I just bought some property. I got to put the plow to it. Or, you know, I got some business transactions that I have to take place. And all of these various things, people are coming up with excuses on why they really don't have the time to come to the wedding banquet. And so the Lord becomes angry and he sends them out and he says, listen, you just go find whoever you can find that's willing to come. Now that's a direct reflection on the fact that the nation of Israel had rejected the kingdom of God in Jesus and that the Lord is now has been sent the invitation to people like you and I that are called Gentiles. The Holy Spirit is calling us, amen, to come home and he's inviting. But yet even still in the midst of this church age that we live in, we see the same thing happening. People are so caught up and busy with their life. They're caught up in the midst of relationships. They're caught up in the midst of their jobs. They're caught up in the midst of living the American dream. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Everybody's wanting to live the American dream. People are flooding over the border to live the American dream. And there's, I don't remember how the lyric went, but I searched the world over. And I was looking for something to fill me. But I'm here to tell you that the American dream is not going to fill you. Praise God for being an American. I've been to Singapore. I've been to Europe. I've been to Venezuela and Mexico. All those places were real nice. But hallelujah, I'm so glad I was born in America. Amen. Amen. Nevertheless, if you're looking for the American dream to fill the hole, because you see, if this story is true, and I'm talking about this story right here, and I'm convinced it is, if this story is true, there's only one thing that's going to fill the hole in your heart. There's a God-sized hole that's prepared just for Jesus to be there, and you can keep searching, you can keep looking, but if you keep trying to plug stuff up, other things in there, it's not going to going to accomplish for you what you're hoping that it's going to accomplish. And so we have this wedding banquet, but there's a rejoicing in the banquet and that God is wanting us to get to the place because see there, the Bible talks about the fact that there's going to be great celebration. I want you to know that that's God's plan, that you would become a son of God. That you would become a child of the Most High God. That's God's plan on this earth. Listen, this is this can't be church as usual. We can't just follow the traditions, the vain traditions of our fathers. You know, the scripture talks about that You in 1 Peter. You follow after the vain traditions of your fathers. We're not here just to do church as usual. And we either believe this book or we don't. Amen. And if we believe this book, then what we got to understand is, is that if you start to think about some of these things, you start to come to the realization that you were placed on this earth for the direct purpose of being able to make a decision on what you're going to do with Jesus. No, because now you got to trust me a little bit because I've read the book and maybe some of you haven't read the whole thing. I've read it multiple times and I'm here to tell you it becomes very clear that this is the whole reason that your mother's egg, if I can say that, was fertilized. For you to have a physical existence upon the earth, but for one greater purpose than that is for you to have the opportunity.
opportunity to be part of that banquet, yes. to be yes. part of the rejoicing, yes. amen, that God the Father is looking to give you the opportunity for. Yes. And if you miss that, you've missed it all. I don't care what kind of car you drive. I don't care how big your house yes. is, yes. how much 401, 401k money you have in the, right. in the bank. I don't care what none of that looks like. If you miss this opportunity, you yes. have missed the whole point and the whole purpose to life. I am convinced of that and I'm not going to change my story. Yes. Yes. So, you know, the king, the king's son and bride multitudes are being invited <clears throat> and really the parable of the prodigal son focuses on this very thing. It's a celebration. It's a, it's a banquet of celebration. The whole chapter in Luke 15 centers on this concept. There's two parables that come before this. The first one is the sheep. You remember the 99 sheep? What man having 99 sheep, if one gets lost, he doesn't go and find it, right? And so it says that the shepherd goes and he searches for that one sheep. When he finds it, he's full of joy. He picks it up. He puts it on his shoulders. I'm here to tell you, you might try to wander from the Lord. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody in here and you've been saved, but you hadn't really been living for the Lord the way that you were supposed to. The Lord's not going to give up on you. That's and the right. Lord's not angry at you. The Lord loves you. And he committed himself. And listen, he wants to pick you up and he wants to put you on your shoulders. And he wants to carry you Amen. to safety. Amen. And then the next parable was the woman that had the ten coins, right? She had ten, but she lost one. And so what she did was she didn't just give up on that one. She diligently searched and she swept until she found it. And listen, in the first parable, the Bible says that this is what happens. Heaven rejoices whenever those that are lost come into the kingdom. And when she found that coin, she called all of her friends and she said, won't you come rejoice with me? I found my coin. And the scripture says the same thing happens in the kingdom of God. That whenever one sinner comes to repentance, the angels of God, they rejoice in heaven. There's a rejoicing that takes place. Amen. And finally, we come to the parable of the prodigal. And that word prodigal literally means extravagant. It means wasteful. L literally in the verse, I believe it was verse, uh, verse 13. It says he wasted his substance. Listen to me. He wasted his inheritance. And the word wasted right there is connected to the word winnowing. Y'all heard me talk about winnowing before and through the years. Well, well, that's how they used to. That's how used to bring in the harvest. So back in them days, they didn't have John Deere tractors, right? And they'd have to bring in the grain, and they'd have to get a big old stone, and they'd pull it behind a horse, and they'd crunch that grain, get that chaff off, kind of like a little popcorn piece thing, and then they'd have a pile of grain, and they'd put it on a flat land where the wind could blow, and then they'd have kind of like a winnowing shovel or a winnowing fork, right? And they'd stick it up under there, and they'd throw it up in the air, and then the grain would fall, but the wind would take the chaff. He basically winnowed his inheritance. It was just like throwing it, like taking hundreds of, in modern day time, it'd be like taking hundred dollar bills and just throwing it in the wind and just letting it. He just lived in the old wasteful way that he wanted to live. And spiritually speaking, people do that. They just throw their inheritance away because, listen, I'm talking to you about a spiritual inheritance. Yeah. If what I'm telling you is true, and I hope that you can believe it at least just a little bit, and even have a little bit of faith to believe what I'm trying to tell you, and that your purpose on this earth is to make a decision about eternity. Listen, Jesus came that we could have eternal life. And whenever we squander an inheritance, listen, I'm not just talking about like an inheritance that you get from your daddy or from your mama. I'm talking about the inheritance that you're to receive from your father in heaven. Yeah. And whenever we just live our life any way we want to, according to our own will, we could be squandering and being wasteful and winnowing away our inheritance that God the Father has plan for us. Because you see, God has a will for your life. God has a will and a purpose for your life. And it's bigger than your own will and your own purposes. And that's the heart of our master. That's the heart of Jesus. When he was in the garden, he said, not my will, but your will be done. And so, you know, this whole context creates, you got these two sons, right? And the older son, he's definitely a type of the Pharisees, right? Because they're, they're like, look at this man. He receives sinners. 
Yeah, he received. The word receive, the, one of the meanings there is means to take by the hand and bring them into the family. That's what Jesus does. He takes people by the hand and he brings them into the family of God. So these Pharisees are a type of, uh, of the older brother who is unhappy, who is, becomes angry, who really, that's the posture of his heart is envy and jealousy. Now listen, Christian, uh, hopefully a lot of you guys are getting set free from some of the things of your past, right, that just to really hold you down. You, you know what I'm talking about? The things that you wake up the next morning and you ain't feeling right and you feel feeling kind of guilty. Can I tell you that that's the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart, yeah, right. right? I'm not even going to list through it today. I just don't feel like it, you know, because the Holy Spirit knows how to speak to you better than I do. Yeah, yeah. But there's things in your in our life. And, hope, and listen, the longer we walk with the Lord, if we're growing in Christ, hopefully those things are are, are, are becoming part of the past, right? And, we're, and we're, they might be in the rearview mirror, but they're not in the car with us anymore. Yeah. Amen. But with, with all of that said, Christians, I'm talking to Christians this morning, deal with heart posture that many times isn't right. Situations like jealousy and envy. Yeah. Listen to me. If you see a, a brother or a sister that's been wayward and been gone and they come back to the house of God and all you got to think in your heart is, huh, I wonder what they've been doing. Huh, I wonder where they've been and what's been going on with them. You need to check your yes, heart, Christian. Yes, you need a gut check because let me tell you something. The Holy Jesus ain't nothing like that. Amen. And that's kind of how that older brother is. And that's how them Pharisees were. They're like, look at him. He receives sinners. He eats with sinners. Yeah, that's what Jesus does. He yeah. saves sinners. Hallelujah. He saves people that know they need saving. And look, we just want to get our heart right is what we really want to do. We want our heart, the posture of our heart to be like Jesus. And so that's the one. And then and then you got the sinners. And, and, and that's, the, that's the brother that, that, took, uh, that wanted his inheritance and began uh, to throw it away. Amen. Praise God. So look, we go to verse 12. It says that the younger, he asked for his inheritance so that he could go his own way. This is, I want you to know something, that this is free will in action. I, I, I'm, I'm, getting a, I'm going to get a little bit of teaching on you a little bit. I want you to know that the Lord created you with a free will. The Holy Spirit, the Father in heaven, is not demanding anything from you. <laughs> He's not going to, to demand that you serve him. He's not going to demand that you stay in his house. He's not going to demand that you stay under his protection and blessing. He created you with a free will and he has given you a choice to make a decision whether or not you will believe his story, whether you will believe his word and whether or not you will submit yourself to what he says in this book. Listen to me. I've had, look, I hate to say it, but I've had a jaded past. It just is what it is. I've been, I've had so many confrontations with the law and, you know, sometimes still, I still have been known to get a speed ticket every night. <laughs> Lord help me. But it never fails every single time, usually whenever I get stopped by a policeman in, in the past or whatever, maybe not, maybe not every time. Maybe we don't get into any of the stories, but I'm like, well, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know that the speed limit, I'm pretty sure this was a speed trap anyway. Oh Lord, <laughs> calm down, preacher. <laughs> you have to get yourself twisted off. But anyway, I, but I didn't know that the speed changed from 65 to 45 that quick. You, you know, that policeman is, I mean, they've let me slide a couple of times, but that, that ignorance of the law is no excuse. It, the, the speed limit signs were on the road. The road signs were on the road. The word of the living God was given to humanity. Now, that's some of people's arguments, and this isn't even in my message. But they're like, but that's not the word of God. That was written by men. Well, you can believe what you want, but the word's testimony of itself is that it's theonoustos. Theo God, Neustos breathed, it's God breathed. God breathed into man and through man gave a written word for man to have. He wants to teach man his character, he wants to teach man his heart. But man in his own free will chooses instead to live according to his own will instead of God's will and rejects through a spirit of rebellion. Listen, ignorance of the law is not going to be an excuse. Jesus himself said that in the last day, 
I'm not going to judge any man. In another spot, he says this, judgment has been given to me because the father trusts me because I judge righteous judgment. It means he doesn't judge like you do. He doesn't judge like I do. He judges righteous judgment because he sees the beginning and, and the end and all points in between. But this is what he says. I'm not even going to judge him on the last day. He said, the word that I have spoken yes, yes. is going to be the judge. On, so you can try all you want to, my friend, to plead ignorance of the law. But according to this word right here, that ain't going to work. And God, amen, sent his precious son to deliver us. And that's the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus is to seek, seek and to save them which are lost. So we're talking about the free will. The free will of man, he said, give me my inheritance, give me what belongs to me, and I'm going to go on my own. And I just want you to know that the Lord is not demanding that anyone stay under his blessings and protection. But I do need you to understand this, that when we step outside of God's will, that we, we, what we're doing when we do that is we're embracing a spirit of rebellion. And when we embrace a spirit of rebellion, I want you to understand something that happens in the spiritual realm. Born of Adam, you were born with something called a sinful nature. I'm not trying to get too technical on this, but you receive from your father, Adam, a sinful nature. And when you step and now, that's not supposed to be the normal relationship of a believer. The normal relationship of a believer with the sinful nature is that that relationship is supposed to be dead because we died in Christ and we became one with him in his death and his burial. And even as he was raised from the dead, we too should walk in newness of life. The whole letter to the Roman church in chapter 7 is talking about how this sinful nature or the power of sin is broken through our union with Christ and what he did for us at the cross. So that's not normal Christianity for, for the sinful nature to have power over us. That's not the way that it's supposed to be. But let me say this. When you step outside of the protection and the blessing of God, when you venture outside, that's called a spirit of rebellion, and the longer you you go in that direction, the more powerful the sinful nature becomes. And so maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, I don't really know why I got all this going on in my life. I want to tell you, you don't have to have all that going on in your life. I want to tell you right now that the word of God says you're free. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Yes, yes. And we need to get to the point where we start believing what's written in this book right here and quit believing what we feel, what we think, and instead start to believe what the Lord thinks and what he feels. Amen. And so the further we grow, go, the stronger it grows. And in the rebellious decisions that we make, we partner with evil and we end up squandering or winnowing away or being wasteful with this spiritual inheritance that the Lord has provided for us. Amen. So he goes in verse 13. It's at the end of the little verse there. He says he journeys into a far country and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And then it says in verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. You see, when he first started, he wasn't in want. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that when he first started, he was excited. Yes, now yes. think about that, because I want to talk to you a little bit about, about the lies and the deception of sin. You, you know, I've been around long enough, unfortunately, to where I know that, listen, Sin promises a whole lot of things, my friends. You'll even get sometimes a little butterfly in your belly, right? A little flutter in your heart, like, like whatever, until you start to recognize to what happened to this old boy right here. In the end, I'm like, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But a lot of times there's some kind of an excitement to that, yep. right? Oh, man, we're about to go get our whatever on. Right. And it's like you feel that little flutter and it's like you get all excited. Sometimes that happens in a new relationship. And look, you can even get you can be so confused. You'll you'll think, man, oh, man, this feels oh, like I feel that little flutter. I feel that little butterfly in my belly. Man, this must be this must be something good. No, it's not something good. Not if it's against the word of the Lord. You're over here believing something that's going to that you think is going to bring you joy and happiness. And in reality, it's going to end up leaving you empty. It's going to end up leaving you sad because it's just another trip around the block. Lord help us. Amen. So he started, he didn't start off that way though, but, but he began to be in want because of this famine. He became destitute. He, he, he began to lack. 
You know, on the surface, you know, I, I do want to say this, though. On the surface, this looks really bad. The power of sin has stolen all of his blessings. And now to make matters worse, uncontrollable circumstances have resulted in a famine and only worsening the hopelessness and the despair. And with every choice he makes, he takes one step deeper into despair. But I still can't help but think about that father. There's a father at home. Amen. You know? And in the physical, I see him as a praying father. He's praying that his son would, would come back home. But in the spiritual, amen, he's a father that's orchestrating circumstances. He's orchestrating circumstances and he's causing some shift to take place. From the heavenly crown, the heavenly father causes a spiritual shift to take place that manifests itself on earth. I want to tell you something, that the God of glory, he loves you so much. And listen, maybe you have a loved one. Maybe you have a spouse. Maybe you have a child. Maybe you have a friend and you're concerned about that. And, 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 and you don't know you're concerned because they're, they're walking in a wayward direction or they're, they're in a situation where they don't seem like they're getting better and things seem like they're getting worse. And then, and then something else shifts in the situation and it just seems like it went from bad to worse. But I want, I want to encourage you and I want you to understand that our job is to hold on to the, with faith and to believe in the God of glory that he is orchestrating the situation, that he is setting up the stage because he knows the beginning from the end. He knows how to get each individual to the spot where they need to be so that he can do the transforming miracle working power that needs to take place in their lives. And, and many times we face these challenges with these loved ones and it spirals down so fast and, 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 and it just seems like it's, it's, it's like impossible. How in the world, does, am I just preaching to myself this morning, but are, have you ever been in a situation where, where it looks like to the physical eye it looks like the situation's hopeless. Yes. But I'm here to tell you that what you see in the physical is not what's happening in the spiritual. Yeah. We serve a spiritual, supernatural God that transcends natural boundaries. Yes. And we don't have to believe what we see with our physical eyes. As a matter of fact, we're not supposed to believe what we see with our physical eyes. We're supposed to believe what we know according to the word of God. And so what looked bad actually becomes the turning point. In this young man's life. Yes, yes. In this sinful state of mind. In desperate circumstances. He keeps making decisions. That he would not have normally made. He would not have normally made. As a child of God. Listen to me. We're talking because it's a parable. But we're talking about the people of God here. We're talking about people that come out of the nation of Israel. Jesus is talking to the leaders and, and, and he's preparing a parable for them to understand that we're talking about the people of God here. And, and, and he makes a decision that he would not have normally made. He joined himself to a citizen of a foreign country who raised hogs for a living. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, that right there was a major, if I could just say it, faux pas. That was a major, major mess up. You, as a Jew, you're not allowed to be around unclean animals like that. And hogs were, were the worst. And so his decisions are driving him further and further into despair, into disappointment. And the struggle, it just seems to be worsening. And I'm just going to take this opportunity right here because you never know who's in the crowd. That's one of the reasons that the Lord repeatedly instructs his children not to connect themselves to the people of the world. Because the people of the world live outside of a kingdom of God perspective. Yep. Mm -hmm. Their lives are surrounded by unclean things. Mm -hmm. Their business dealings are unclean. It's all they know because they don't know God. Now listen, I'm not trying to tell you that you don't ever do, can't ever do business with a person that's in the world, peripheral business. That's not what I'm trying to say. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. You know, don't don't think that I'm saying something that I'm not saying. But what I'm saying is, is that when you closely align yourself with people in the world, like whether it be business partnership, but especially marriage and especially close friendships. And, and listen, I'm not saying that you never can go have coffee with one of your old friends. That's not what I'm trying to say. 
But I'm trying to make a point that when you closely align yourself with people that are in the world and they have their minds and their hearts set on the things of the world, then you are not going to be moving in the right direction if you're constantly fellowshipping with them. They're going to start moving you in yes. a wrong direction. Yes. Okay, that's what ends up happening to people. And so, that, and that's the reason that the Lord, the Lord has this written throughout the scriptures about telling the children of Israel not to intermarry with the people of the world and vice <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. But we're, I just wanted to use that little point because it's kind of like it's in the story. His connection to this man caused him to go even further and deeper. And it came to the point in verse 16 where it says he would, he would feign. And, you know, I know I've told some of y'all this before. I realized this when I looked this word up in the Greek. This is where the word fiend comes from. And I, some of you may not even know what that word means. But he would have fiend or he would have fiend. He was craving the pig pods. He was craving to, to eat the hog slop. And can I just tell you something? Whenever people are living a life like that through addiction, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. and the things that they find themselves and they, and they use that word fiend or fiend. Yes. That's exactly what they're doing. And, so, and I know because I've been there. Right. I've, been, I've been in places of darkness. I've been in places of sinful activity. And it's just doing nothing but destroying my life. Whether it was sexual promiscuity or whether it was with drugs or alcohol. Right. I've been on all of those little streets. And every time I ended up on that street, it led me to a yes. place yes. where I was craving something that wasn't doing me any good. It was only hurting me and it was only driving me deeper and deeper into a pit and making it seem almost impossible for me to come out. I'm here to tell you that that's not God's will. In his mind, listen, I just want you to say this. This is what I'm seeing in the scriptures whenever I read it. Some of this is my commentary. But in his mind, he, he has lost his sonship. That's how he's perceiving this situation that he's in. He's lost his sonship. His inheritance is gone. Furthermore, he's losing his self-esteem. Every choice that he makes, every decision that he goes further away, he's losing more and more self-esteem. And Satan's plan for his life appears to be in full throttle. Now, I want to I make a point to you because this whole story is about sonship. This whole story is about his sons, the man's sons. And, and, and as the father, though, it's a spiritual story where God, the father, is really the one we're talking about here. And, and you as a son of God are the ones that we're talking about here. But I do want to make this clear that we're not all children of God. People have people have said that. Right. And I know most of you already know this, but but we're not all children of God. All of God's creation. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. In order to be a child of God, the scripture teaches in John chapter 1, it says this, that those that believe in his name, God gave them the power to become the sons or the children of God. Yeah. So you have to, with your free will, believe in in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to believe that he is the one that God the Father sent. You have to believe that he died on the cross for your sin. And you have to receive that sacrifice by faith for yourself. And immediately, listen, whenever that happens, the Holy Spirit, when it really happens. I'm not talking about just because you prayed a prayer in vacation Bible school when you were eight years old. Maybe it happened then, but just because you prayed a prayer doesn't automatically. Because, see, the scripture says this. you got to believe from your heart and confess with your mouth. See, you can believe in your head before you ever but, and, but, and never have believed in your heart. But when you believe from your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, something shifts in the spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. And that is the that is the down payment of your inheritance. And it's letting you know that you have now become a son of God. Amen. So I want I want you to know that. So but he's thinking, man, I've, I've lost I've lost my sonship in his mind. I've lost my inheritance. And, and it looks like Satan's got the upper hand, right? And, 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 I, and I just imagine what Satan's thinking, okay? I'm, then again, this is my commentary. It's not in the text. But I'm imagining because I've been around a little while and I've seen how he's tried to deal in my life and how he deals in other people's lives. 
And I can imagine Satan saying this, if I can just get him to lower his face in the slop, if I can just get him to take it one step further, I've kind of strung him along all this time. I was real tricky here and there, and he didn't really know exactly what he was getting into. And then once I had it, I, once I pulled the, set the hook, he wasn't able to get, if I could just get him to put his face in the slop right there and to eat with them all. I got him right where I want him. I'll nail that last nail in the coffin. His self-esteem will be so destroyed that he won't have any hope left. It'll be, he ain't coming back from that. Now, that's what the enemy thinks. Right. The enemy thinks the whole time that he's just carrying somebody a little bit further. But I'm here to tell you that instead of that, a spiritual shift takes place. The Holy Spirit, this is how I look at it. Because look, we're talking about sonship. We're talking about the people of God. So I'm just going to go ahead and take some liberty and I'm going to preach it like this. That whenever you're a son of God, the Holy Spirit becomes one with your spirit. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Your, your spirit and the Holy Spirit become one. And what I, hear, what I want you to know is this, is that the Holy Spirit, want to, whenever you find yourself in situations that you're a true child of God, that at some point in time, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to your spirit and he's going to try to get you in your spirit to start telling your mind the right thing. Because your soulless man, your mind wants to get in the way of the things of God. And it wants to try to believe the lies and the pig slop and the misery and the bad situation. It wants to get you to believe that what the world has to offer you is going to make you happy and the spirit of God on the inside of you once you become a born again Christian wants to come alive and wants to speak to you and wants to say to you no what you feel is, is part of your emotions and that's part of your soul what you think is part of your soul and, and no you need to start thinking like God thinks and what God's word says it's time for you to rise up son because you haven't lost anything the devil's just been trying to hold you down now get up and get out of this pit. Yeah. 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 But the enemy, he don't want to quit either. But the spiritual shift takes place. Hallelujah. God's ready to give him back his sonship. Amen. So God is moving on his heart and convincing him to move towards home. <laughs> and he says to himself, he starts to have a talk with himself. That's why I love that song so much. Because, you know, sometimes I know that we all walk in here in the morning, sometimes you can feel the spirit of heaviness in the yeah, sanctuary, right. right? Because, look, life tries to beat you down during the week. Now, we, a lot of times we do some of this stuff to ourselves, but let Pastor Matt calm down a little bit. <laughs> Let's just stay focused. We, we, sometimes the choices we make, like the prodigal, we're heaping this heaviness on us, okay? Uh, and let's let us learn that. Yes. Okay. We have choices to make, and the Holy Spirit's there to give us grace to where we can make the right choices. Okay. But but what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes the world and the enemy is trying to beat us up during the week. And so we walk into the house of God, all beat down, and we don't really feel like we have a lion inside of our lungs. Okay. And 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 so this heaviness comes in. But I just want to encourage you guys that understand what I'm trying to say, and you're like, you know what? You're right. I come in. I come into the house of God many times, feeling, feeling beat up and carrying some of the weight of the of what happened the last week with me. Listen, let let us get our head right. It, it, it is, that's how the lyric says it, right? Come on now, soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, because you, you got a lion inside of those lungs. He's talking to his soul. The King David spoke to his soul. He said, why are you downcast within me, old soul? You can speak to your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions that are telling you one thing, but know the Spirit of God on the inside of you is saying something else. You don't have to take the lies of the devil and make them your own. Amen. By the word of faith, hallelujah, you can hold on to and stand on the truth of God's word. Come on, my soul. Soul. Yeah. Don't you get shy on me because you got a lion inside of those lungs. And Jesus is worthy Amen. to be praised. I believe that with all of my heart. I don't know what other people believe. He rescued me. He saved me. I just wish somebody else would get saved. I wish somebody else would get rescued. I wish somebody else would come to the realization that the Lord pulled them out. Hallelujah. Pulled them out of that pit. Pulled them out of that pig pen and brought them into new life. Amen. Amen. So he speaks to his soul. 
He's like, what are you doing? Yes, yes. You can go to your father. Hallelujah. Now look at this. I mean, you can't be a son anymore. That's a lie. <laughs> but we'll, we'll deal with that in a little bit. You can't be a son, but he will at least take you back as a servant. Just being a servant in your daddy's house. You can live in the servant quarters, you know, and he'll feed you some bread. Man, you'd be a whole lot better off than where you are right here, right now. And I want to give you three thoughts related to the prodigal's turning point right here. Point number one is this, the Joseph factor. I'm calling it the Joseph factor. Because you see, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says this, but as for you, he's talking to his brothers, Joseph. After he had been in an Egyptian prison, he says, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. The Joseph factor. See, I want you to know this is that what evil has planned for you, God is going to turn it around yes, for yes. good. Hallelujah. But you see the enemy going into the lives of your family and it looks bad and it looks like it's hopeless. I'm here to tell you, hold on to the Lord. Hold on to the garment. Yeah. The hem of Jesus is garment and refuse to let go. Yeah. Hold on to faith. Connect your faith to the King of Israel. Amen. And don't let go. And look, what evil plans for bad, the Lord is in the business of turning it around. Amen. Like that song we used to say, late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. Amen. He's going to work in your favor. Yeah. Amen. When it looks like there's no hope. And look, and once he turns it around, he's going to use it as a testimony yeah. in the lives of other people. Yeah. God has a plan for your life. And listen, the things that you used to be in bondage to and the things that were making you unhappy and feeling hopeless or, or empty, whenever you let Jesus really have his way in your heart, you know what our problem is? I believe this. And, and I know what I'm talking about because I, cause I used to because I used to be like that. Whenever I first got saved, man, I used to think that the, that the things in the church were so lame. I'm, I hate to tell you that. I can remember riding down the road with Danielle, and she's putting in some songs, uh, Christian songs. I'm like thinking to myself, dude, that stuff is lame, bruh. Like, them guys can't get those licks like Eddie. I mean, come on. Like, what in the world? You know? But you know you know what? This and Maybe there's some truth to that. We won't get into the whole spiritual stuff behind that right now. But but what, I, what I'll say is this, though. I'd rather hear a song that's glorifying Jesus now. Yes. Yeah. And, and giving praise to the Amen. King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm so happy that the Lord didn't leave me where I started Amen. off. Amen. Amen. But I used to think that the things of God, even after a Christian, and I'm telling you, I was going to church three times a week and, and paying and started paying my tithes. Man, that was a big deal. You know, wait, what? You going to put money in the back? Yeah, and I started paying my tithes and still was thinking that some of the ways of the world were cool because that's what I had been entrenched in right, right. for so long. I'm here to tell you, man, the ways of the world are not cool. The world does not love you. Uh, they, they may act like they love you, but just like they did to Jesus, man, one day they'll be loving you, and the next day they'll be nailing you to the yeah, cross. Yeah, yeah. And you can go ahead and you can hold on to a relationship with the world if that's what you choose to do, but I'm trying to encourage you to let go of the world and yes. grab hold of Jesus. Amen. Yes. And you're going to find And listen, I'm going to tell you something else. If you Look, I watched the news for the first time in months while I was on vacation. And if you think that, that this world is not falling apart, if you think for one second, oh, it's always been like, no, nah, that ain't true. It ain't always been like this, my friend. This world is falling apart. And the Word of God talks about these yes. things. The right. days are growing darker, man. It's time for us to wake up, grab a hold of Jesus, and not let go. Amen. Amen. But look. That's the Joseph factor. What the enemy meant for bad in your life, I'm telling you right now, God's going to turn around. Point number two uh, is this. Trails of tragedy paved the way to wisdom. Listen, I just want to say this. I had a couple of scriptures, but I'm not going to take the time to go through. But, but I want you to know this. This man is not going to be the same once he makes it home. You know, yes. hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's so good. Thank you, Jesus. I don't care how far you run away. I don't care how far you go. I don't care how the devil is a liar. He's trying to convince your soul. He's trying to convince your mind and your will and your emotions. He's trying to convince you that there's no more hope. And he is a liar. And I cast his lies to the ground in the name of Jesus. I take authority over every demonic. 
demonic assignment over your lives in the name of Jesus. God has a plan for your life. He ain't going to be the same, my friend. I wish I had time to get into those scriptures. You know, as a son, we learn some, the spirit of a disciple learns some things as you travel the journey of Christianity. And I'm going to go ahead and say a little, a little bit of this, that, that the, new, the new creation... Because, see, one of the scriptures I wasn't going to tell you about comes out of Proverbs 2, but it says this, When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge becomes pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you. And, you know, discretion describes something having to do with your mental faculty. It's like you're thinking about this situation. And what I'm trying to say is, is that when he goes home, he's not going to be the same as he used to be. Right, right. Because, see, he's got something called now experiential knowledge. Yes, yes. And, you know, it talks about that in 2 Peter chapter 1. That through the knowledge we have of him, that's not just a book learning knowledge. That's an experiential aspect to knowledge. It's where you add the book knowledge you got in the scripture to live in life and learn it sometimes the hard way. Yes. And this man's learning some stuff the hard way. Daddy used to call that his son, and now my dad did not serve the Lord. And I believe at the end he might have received Christ. I hope so. Amen. He raised his hand a few times. <laughs> but but, I, but he was an old leatherneck Marine, right? And I remember, I remember him saying, Boy, I wish you'd learn from me what I try to tell you, but you don't want to listen to nobody. So like your old daddy, you're going to have to go to the school of hard knocks. And isn't that true that so many yes, times we can't yes. just learn, but we got to go, we got to know, that's that free will part. That's that free will. I'm just going to go on and venture out of here, just see what happens. But I'm here to tell you, that man is not going to be the same because he's done gained some experiential knowledge. And when discretion, when wisdom enters your heart and, and wisdom becomes pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. But it's more than just you knowing something's wrong. You need more help than just knowing something's wrong. There's a whole lot of people that know stuff is wrong. Yes, and so I want to talk to you just real quick to understand that the disciple is learning some things in the journey. And if he's in the word of God and he's being taught the word of God, some of the things that he's learning is this, is that as a son, the scriptures says you have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old creation died with Jesus on the cross, was buried with Jesus in the tomb, and has been resurrected with Jesus through the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us death has no more hold on us. Sin is no longer our master because you know why? We're no longer under the dominion of law. That's Romans chapter 6 verse 14. Instead, we're now under the covenant of grace. Yes, yes, yes. Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit strengthening you, empowering you, giving you power over the works of darkness. Can you believe that this morning? Can you believe that what Jesus did for you on the cross was enough and that what Jesus did for you on the cross actually shifted everything in the spirit realm and gives you access to the Holy Spirit of God? I'm, ta I'm not talking about willpower right now. Yes. I'm not talking about the counselor. I'm not talking about your best friend trying to talk you down from the roof. I'm talking about Jesus. Yes. I'm talking about he already went before you and he paid the way. The scripture says he is the pioneer, the author and the finisher of your faith. Jesus said as he was hanging on the cross one of the last things he spoke before he died, it is finished. He paid the debt. He paid a debt. Oh, I wish I could sing. He paid a debt he didn't know. Go ahead and turn that mic on, sister. Come on. Turn that mic on and sing it for us a little bit. He paid a debt he didn't know. He owed a debt. Sing it. Come on. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, yes. amazing grace. My Jesus paid the debt, Christ Jesus paid 
paid the debt. My Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. How Amen. I love them old songs. So look, he paid a debt he didn't know. He paid it. He, he finalized it. You know what the scripture, I remember my old preacher in Franklin, man, he preached a message one time when he said it is finished. The word was tetelestai in the Greek. It means pow, stamp, paid in full. It's been paid in full, my friend. Jesus has already done the work. And because of what he did, I can't get this point across to you enough. You don't have to try to live for God in your own strength. If you will yield yourself and yield your free will to the will of God, then the Holy Spirit will empower you and he will pull you out of this situation. I wrote this little verse down right here. And I, I was surprised because it rhymed. I wasn't trying. He's it, 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 speaking to his soul. Right? And he's got this experiential knowledge. And when he gets back home, the experiential knowledge, along with being a son and having access to the Holy Spirit's grace and power, he's going to be like, he's going to sit back and he's going to have discretion. And he's going to look, he's going to, this is, this is the way it ought to work, my friend. That we're going to look at the situation and we're going to see what the devil's offering. Be like, no, I'm not going that route again. And you lying butterflies in my belly <laughs> and you lying flutter in my heart. You are a liar. And I'm not going back there because I remember the pig pen. Oh. I remember the pig pen. And so listen, you don't despise what the Lord's brought you out of. Amen. Amen. You remember what the Lord. So I kind of made this like this was him saying, remember the slop. Remember the pain. Remember the cross. Don't go there again. Amen. Amen. And bam, it's that easy. Yeah. That's the victory of Jesus. Yeah. That's what the Word of God says. No, it's not. Listen to me. It's not a 12-step program that we integrate into the church. It's not. And I'm not trying to cause conflict, man. I'm trying to make a point. It's not psychology that we intermingle with our theology. It's not. It's not a, a, all this other. It's Jesus, and it's what He's already done for us, and that He broke the power of sin. That's what it says in the Scripture, Colossians two fourteen and fifteen, that He triumphed over the powers of darkness when, through the cross. When He paid the debt that was owed to God from sinful man, He paid the debt for us because He was without sin. None of this is in my notes, but you need to understand this: that He was without sin. I couldn't pay the debt of my sin because I was a sinner and I deserved to die. The scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus had no sin and he came to earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't have sin. But see, Adam was created before the world was fallen. And Adam was created, amen, and the life of God was given unto Adam. And he was without sin before he fell. But all of the human race coming out of Adam is in a fallen condition. And they're already born sinners. So don't get mad at the preacher when he talks about sin. Because I'm in the boat too. We're all born sinners. But hallelujah, once we're saved, we ain't sinners no more. Amen. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that you can't die for your own sin. You can't die for your own sin. That's why Islam don't work, my friend. You, you don't get, okay, you don't get, if you're a martyr in Islam, you don't get your 72 virgins, my friend. It don't work that way. That, because, see, your blood is tainted with sin too, Mr. Martyr. No, it required a sinless one to pay. Adam was created without sin. Jesus came to the earth without sin. And Jesus paid the debt for sinners of which I was chiefest. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us. So this is the last thing I wanted to see. I told you three things. The Joseph factor. The trails of tragedy paved the way of wisdom, right? He's going to have discretion when he goes home. The last thing was this. What Satan was saying to him is not what the father's thinking at home. <laughs> Can I tell you that? Yeah. When you find yourself yes. in the midst of a bad situation and, and, and you feel like the enemy is just over there pounding you. Can I tell you that he is a liar and the yes. father of lies? And what he's telling you is not the same thing that the father is thinking about you. I want you to know that. If you don't remember anything else that I said, because I, I use a lot of words. But look, the, the father is not thinking the same thing about you that the devil is trying to whisper in your ear. 
The Father has nothing but love for you. And so look, he finally gets up and he starts heading home. And, and in Luke chapter 15, verse 20, it says, He arose, he came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know, I can't prove it, but it's almost like the father was looking in that direction almost every day. Yes. Just waiting to see the first hint of movement towards home. And once he sees it, the goodness of God moves like the scripture yes. says. And the goodness of God brings a man to repentance. Yes. And look what he says in verse 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no worthy, no more worthy to be called your son. And I can see the father right now. He said, I accept the repentance, but I'll just lose your sonship." Up, I won't have none of it. Get him a robe, get him a ring, put some shoes on his feet, yeah. kill a fat attack. The sun was gone, but now he's come home and it's time to have a banquet celebration. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I do want to just linger on those words for a little bit longer. <laughs> I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Mm. Now we know that that's a lie. To some extent, it's a lie of the enemy. Because God's all about restoration. He's all about reconciliation. Amen. But can I tell you that for restoration to take place, there does have to be this posture of the heart. Yes. Where you realize that you did, you failed the Lord. You know what I'm getting at? Like, and you ain't got to come do business with Pastor Matt. Amen. It's not necessary. Amen. There's one mediator. That's yes. It. Yes. That's it. There's one mediator between, between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. You don't have to come out and sit down with Pastor Matt. If you need somebody to talk to, I'm here for you. But I'm, but I'm here to tell you, you can do business with the Lord. But that needs to be the posture of your heart. You need to be sorrowful. You need to recognize when you've gone outside of the will of God, true repentance says, I come to the realization, I was wrong, Lord. You were right. You were right all along, and I did not I did not live my life that way. Now I'm repenting, and I desire to get my heart right, Lord. I'm no longer worthy. And see, listen, if you'll come with that posture of heart, you know what he'll do? Get up, son. Get up, son. You know, I accept the repentance. Get up. Now it's time for restoration. I got a robe and a ring for you. I'm going to close it out with the robe and the ring. Because I want you to know that this has to do with identity. The scripture says in Galatians 3 and 27 that those that have been baptized into Christ have put him on. The NIV version says you have clothed yourself with Christ That's Jesus. Good. Zechariah chapter 3 says that in the spirit realm, Joshua the high priest was clothed in filthy garments and Satan was standing at his right hand ready to accuse him. But the Lord turned around and he said, take those filthy garments off of him and put clean garments on him. And that's exactly what the Lord did. Listen, in that banquet, Matthew chapter 22, in the banquet of that of the Mary and the king's son, you know what happened at the end of the story? Not in the Luke version, but in Matthew's version. At the end, he said, the king says, how'd you get in here? You don't have a wedding garment on. How, how did you sneak up in here? No, throw him out and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, people don't like that kind of preaching no more. But Jesus is saying that, not Matt, Jesus, that Jesus preached on hell more than he did heaven. <laughs> there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You might want to fact check. That. <laughs> there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place where the fire isn't quenched, the worm doesn't die. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's either a real place or it's not. And I don't know about you, but I ain't trying to find out the wrong way that I was wrong. So he, 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 he gets himself in that posture. See, man's posture must be repentance, but God's promise is restoration. And so the robe, that's what we wear, the robe. He, he clothes us with that robe of righteousness. Yes, yes. That's your new identity. That's what the scripture teaches. You have a new identity in Christ. That, that you've been clothed with his righteousness. I, I, I have a hard time calming myself down up here. But look, I'm almost done. I promise. Romans chapter 3 says this. That now the righteousness of God apart from the law has been revealed. That's a big old long verse, but we know what it means. Righteousness has a name. Yes. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And whenever you put faith in Christ, God the Father clothes you with the righteousness of Jesus. 
That's how you get men, my friend. Not based on your own righteousnesses. How, that should really set you free. That should really set you free and, and, and un, lift a burden off of your heart. You're not getting in on your own righteousness. You're getting in in his righteousness. But the beauty of that is now clothed in his righteousness, you have a release of the Holy Spirit in your life yes, to empower yes, you yes. to live righteous. Yes, Amen. Yes. That's beautiful. So that's the robe and then the rain. And the singers, musicians, y'all can come up. And listen, the rain it signifies identity again. It signifies sonship. Because you see on this ring, they, they also call it a signet. Because it, it had the family sign on it. And so he's able to operate in the authority of his father. I want you to understand that as a son of God, you and I have the ability to operate in the authority of our father. Our father is a miracle working God. He heals the sick. Amen. Sometimes he performs miracles and like it, the, the sickness is gone immediately. Sometimes it doesn't happen that way. It's a process of time. But we have the authority to operate, amen, in the name of Jesus. Devils tremble at the name of Jesus. Amen. Souls are saved at the name of Jesus. There's power and authority. And that's what that ring represents. I'm here to tell you, I don't know where you've been in your life, but I want you to know that the Lord's calling you home. Amen. And as we worship the Lord, listen, church is dismissed, but if you need prayer, I always want you to know that. If you need prayer for anything, please don't hesitate. Come forward. Let's, let, 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 let me pray for you.